pleasure of having Ernesto Morales as my mentor and one of my advisors for both my master's and my PhD as one of my readers. Um, I'm really happy to be introducing Todd today. Um, his leadership um, in the field of Chicano studies and in the, I'm gonna mispronounce this word, uh, Chicanada, is that right? Um, political action is, um, I think, fundamental and cutting edge to how we understand how social movements operate. I'm gonna leave it to uh, Todd to speak about his research, but I wanna welcome you all and thank you all. So what'll happen is we'll have about 45 minutes of presentation, some Q&A, and then around, um, an hour from now, and I know everybody's in a different time zone, we'll move into the happy hour and that will be faculty only. So thank you all for joining us. How's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Ernesto Tat Morales. Uh, as uh, Serene was saying on the faculty at Prescott College, I'm really happy that uh, to be able to participate in this um, series uh, showcasing uh, faculty research and faculty work. Um, uh, originally from uh, Michigan, I um, received my PhD in uh, 2014 from Michigan State University and came here to work at Prescott College. Um, uh, well, actually, I was here after I was here before that, but um, and I've been here for the last uh, seven years now, uh, working at Prescott College. I'm about to actually take my sabbatical uh, this year. It'll start here pretty soon, and I'm super excited about that. And a large part of what I'm going to talk to you about. Today is uh, some of the projects that I've been working on this past year during the pandemic, um, and also uh, these are all projects that I'll that I'll continue uh, during my sabbatical leave. And so, yeah, pretty pretty pumped. Um, but I'm I'm just gonna get into the um, into the uh, presentation. So I'm gonna do that real quick. This should um, only take a second. We'll we'll find out here. So. I hope that what you're seeing is uh, just a slide. This is organizing opportunities in the 20th century, 21st century for the Chicanada. Um, like many people my age, uh, I was in an undergraduate uh, program in in 1994. Actually, I, I was a little I was a little bit of a late bloomer, so I was a little bit older than the than the average student. But in 1994, uh, there was an event that was very galvanizing. Uh, not just to me, but to many people across the country, uh, particularly those who were involved in uh, Chicano movement politics. And that was the um, the arrival of the uh, Zapatista Army for National Liberation on the scene, uh, January 1st, 1994, emerging out of the Lacandon jungle in uh, defiance of NAFTA and uh, neo-capital liberalism. Um, and, you know, uh, changed a lot of things. I think that, you know, it's right after the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, um, and it had looked like, uh, as uh, I think his name was Fukuyama said, that we had reached the end of history, right? That uh, capitalism and uh, had won, and that was the way the world was going to be. Um, and so, you know, we needed to, uh, to, to deal with it. And I think that the uh, Zapatistas were um, resounding uh, at that moment in terms of their reply to that. And uh, it was a huge impact, right, on, on not just myself, but I, I think that that whole generation. And so um, I'd like to think that uh, a lot of the things that have happened to me since then personally um, are really sort of a, uh, they're kind of an outgrowth of those uh, formative uh, political moments. And so, uh, yeah, this uh, book, Insurgent Aslan, uh, is definitely an outgrowth of those uh, formative political moments. Uh, it's really looking at the, uh, the intersection, right, of, um, of literature, uh, culture, uh, politics, and, uh, you know, national resistance, national liberation resistance, particularly on the part of, of the colonized. And what, what I think is interesting is that um, there are actually two really good books that were written by a, a woman named Barbara Harlow, a professor out of uh, Texas. And uh, basically what Dr. Harlow says is that, um, uh, and she wrote this just a few, these books were published just a few years before the Zapatistas uh, in 1994. But basically Harlow was saying that um, this whole genre of resistance literature was closed, right? Because 
because of the fall of the Soviet Union, because of the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, that uh, you know that these types of movements, these type of liberation movements, were a thing of the past now. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's always the danger, like for any uh, anybody, uh, certainly academics. I think who should know better um, to say, you know, to try to be, you know, super definitive about things like that, uh, because clearly, um, you know, the minute and, and for any of those of you who have kids, you also know this is true. Uh, the minute you say that something's over, it's absolutely not over. Um, and so, you know, in Surgeon Aslan is really an examination of uh, sort of the, the, the spectrum of Chicano literature, um, looking at a lot of different things, film, myth, um, poetry, and, and really starting trying to make a determination about whether or not um, Chicano literature is realist, resistance literature in the sense um, that it comes from a national liberation movement. And so um, I, I had a really good time writing this book um, and I really like this book. I will tell you quite honestly that I've been surprised a little bit by the reaction to this book, uh, which has been overwhelmingly uh, positive. Uh, also, it was published in January of uh, 2020. Last year, it won an International Latino Book Awards um, and actually placed second in the category that, that it came in. And so, um, you know, I saw the other books that it was up against. And I mean, I was like, wow. Uh, that I thought was, thought was really cool. Um, but the determination of the book really boils down to this. And I hope this doesn't stop anybody from buying it. Um, that uh, Chicano literature is resistance literature but that it's resistance literature that belongs to a uh, sort of like a proto national liberation movement, right? I think it is a mistake to say that uh, the Chicano movement uh, rises to the, the level of uh, national liberation movement. I think that the potential is there um, and that's, that's what I say in the book and, and that's why it's titled Insurgent Aslan. Um, the potential is there that this, this could happen, um, but it'll take time and uh, you know, I think that one of the, the major factors, you know, influencing that really has to do with the, the demographic growth that's happened in the, um, you know, in the last, uh, well, particularly in the last 20, 20 years or so. I mean, actually, if you stop and think about it, in 1930, the 1930 census was the first time that um, somebody, uh, the United States government asked people to identify themselves as Mexican. There were 3 million people in 19. 30 who identify themselves as Mexican in the U.S. Census. In uh, 1970, there were uh, 7 million people that um, identified themselves as Mexican. And in 2010, there were uh, somewhere around 30 million. Uh, now that number has gone up even, even further. And so, I, I mean, at, at a certain point, just the, the sheer numbers uh, require a certain investigation right, into the, into the political nature, the political status of a, a group of, of colonized people residing within the, um, you know, the confines of the United States. And so, you know, I also like the slide is saying, I, I don't want to try to pretend like these ideas are new. They're, they're not new. Um, the practice of national liberation, the science and the practice has been an intense uh, topic of discussion for the past 100 years. But I think that there are, are some are some differences, right? As there are with uh, with any any movement. I mean, you can't say that because it, this worked here, this will work there. But I, I think that the big part of it is, is like I was just talking about a second ago, the demographics, right? The demographics are going to uh, change. I mean, in this country by uh, 2030, uh, Latinas will be the, the majority of the plurality in, in this country. Because what we're really heading towards really is, is a a society where there isn't one numerically dominant group, um, but there'll be a plurality. And then, um, you know, what happens then as a result of that? So, I mean, there's, uh, if we look at the last election, I mean, the big, the big question after the last election was, who are these Latinos? What, where did they come from? Why are there so many of them? Um, which, you know, really, if you stop and think about it, is just an, an asinine question, right? Who are these Latinos? Who are these Chicanos? Like, like we just got here. I mean, that's that's part of the problem of the narrative, right? Is that we're uh, constantly assuming, um, or being assumed, 
to be uh, immigrants, right? Newcomers uh, to this country. When uh, the reality is, is that um, that is not true. That at no time in the history of this country since 1848, the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, have uh, individuals who um, were of uh, Mexican uh, descent, um, who were citizens, been outnumbered by individuals who were not citizens. Um, but I mean, if you look at popular culture, you would absolutely assume that that was completely, that it was completely the opposite. Um, so when we think about this, like one of the questions I think that particularly that I'm dealing with uh, in my research, you know, has to do with this idea of, of politicizing um, the community, right? And, you know, um, I mean, primarily when we think about politics, I mean, it's really hard for us to escape this white settler uh, colonial paradigm of Republican uh, Democrat. And so, you know, primarily what happens is that we see people in our community, you know, working very hard, right, to maintain this sort of a uh, colonial structure in terms of politics. And, and, it, and as a matter of fact, really have a hard time talking about um, what politics looks like outside of uh, this colonial structure. Like they, they can't imagine it. They have a hard time talking about it. They get very agitated um, about the question, you know? And so part of what I've been trying to work through over the past, well, not just, that's not true over the past year. I mean, I've been working through it a lot longer than the past year, but I think the last year has really been much more of an intentional investigation into you know this idea of, of political failure, right? I mean, are Chicanos political failures because they don't participate uh, in mass in the settler colonial system, or are they actually political successes because there is this thread of um, of conversation that has to do with national liberation that flow through the literature and through the um, the uh, the organizing that's happening in in different communities, right? Um, you know, and so like these three things say uh, identity, you know, after this last election, right, the biggest question was who are the Latinos? And then the goals of the Chicano movement. I mean, are the goals of the Chicano movement greater access to settler colonial society or national self-determination, right? See, that's a legitimate question, but it's not one that people necessarily want to deal with, right? It's one that scares them, right? And and on top of that, I think that the fear, and this is really one of those things where it's a fear of the unknown. Because when you say that, like, what, is, what does that actually mean, right? What does it mean to be a self-determinative people within a colonial structure, like the ones that we see here in the United States? And, and you know, and is, the, is that even possible? Is it possible to be self-determinate and still be in a colonial relationship? Um, and then the actions, you know, the idea of creating viable national mobilizations based on uh, liberation theories, right? So we see all sorts of like organizing projects that are happening all over the country and, and people are doing really great work in the city that they live in. But I mean, the reality is until those movements, until those locally based movements find a way to connect with each other, they are not challenging colonialism. Colonialism is a structure that exists on a continental level. Okay, so one of the ideas I just wanna throw out to you real quick is this idea of internal, internal colonialism. It says that the main difference between neocolonialism and internal colonialism is the source of exploitation. In the former, the control comes from outside the nation state, while in the latter, it comes from within. And so part of what you know, we're trying to do, and we'll talk about a little bit more about, when I say we, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the projects that um, I have going from past year, from this past year, and, and that will move on with me through this next year. Um, but, you know, I mean, if, if we are an internal colony, if Chicanos and other Latinos are an internal, internal colony, then what that means, right, is that we're, we're being controlled from within. Right. So the struggle, the struggle for liberation, all of that that's happening, right, is happening or it's being directed towards um, towards the, the system that, that that's holding us down. 
we look at this quote over here, Cabral says that the national liberation of a people is the regaining of the historical personality of that people. It is a return to history through the destruction of imperialist domination to which they have been subjected. Okay, so uh, this is actually a really interesting little piece that it's taken from. It's the, the speech is called The Weapon of Theory, and it's part of a speech that Cabral um, delivered in 1966 in Cuba at the Tricontinental Conference. And, you know, he's talking about, he's giving this really Marxist analysis of, um, of national liberation. But I, I think that what's important is that he's saying is that it is the regaining of the historical personality of that people. And, and what he means by that is the political personality of the people who are undergoing this national liberation process, right? Because you have colonialism, okay? There's, there's, there's this moment of contact, there's this moment of, of disruption, uh, a colonial system is, is established. At the moment that that colonial system is established, the history of the colonized ceases, or at least this is what Cabral is saying, and, and I agree with him, right? We don't live, as, colon as colonized people, we are not living our history right now. We are living the history of the colonizer. Now that's not to say that we don't have important things that we've done or things or notable things or that we should be completely dismissed. What it means is that politically we are not in control, right? So when we gain or we regain that historical personality, right? What we're doing is we're reestablishing ourselves as the people who are in control, right? So it is a return to history. When we return to history, we return as a national group. We return as a distinct people, right? Individuals do not return to history. Groups of people return to history, right? It's not internal, uh, you know, internally, um, you know, one person subjected. It's internal colonialism. It's groups of people. And I think this is the part that we're having a hard time with with these days, you know, because we want to think of everything as being very, as very personal. And, and there's no doubt that each of us have very personal um, relationships with these ideas, right? We've had things that have happened to us that, you know, some of them are good, but a lot of them are bad. But individually, we can't accomplish what Cabral is talking about. We can only do that as a group, as a nation, right? So, um, and he says that that happens through the destruction of the imperialist domination to which they have been subjected. So, I mean, actually, when you think about it, that's a pretty, that's also a pretty vague statement because there are lots of ways to destroy something. So what we're talking about is culture and we're talking about politics, right? Culture and politics are inseparable. They cannot exist without each other. And I think that this is also an extremely important point because in the world that we live in that attempts to commodify everything, right? We have, you know, art for art's sake. And, you know, we have things that are, are just cultural. That's, this is cultural, man. Don't bring your politics into it. But they can't be separated. As a matter of fact, as long as there is culture, as long as there's someone who says, this is Chicano culture, right? That in and of itself is a political statement. Because what it does, in saying that, what it does is it places itself in, in opposition, right, to settler colonial society. Uh, Guillermo Bonfil Bataille in his book, Mexico Profundo, he writes that there is a permanent confrontation in the Americas. And that permanent confrontation exists between Mesoamerica and Western civilization. And that that confrontation will only end when one of them has destroyed the other. And so we see that that confrontation is still ongoing. When we say that we're Chicano, when we say that we're indigenous, right? When, when we say that we're Mexican, um, I mean, what, what we're doing is we're, we're placing ourselves in, in opposition to that, um, to that system. Even if you don't really understand it or you don't know it when you're doing it, you're clinging to these old ideas, right? I mean, and, and think about it. Think about how many people have come from Ireland or how many people have come from Germany or how many people have come from Italy or other places, right? They don't, as a group, cling to these notions. 
It's because they have a different relationship with settler colonialism. Um, it's a little uh, quote here from Mao. I think, it's, I think it's very important. He says, our job is not to recite our political program to the people for nobody will listen to such recitations. We must link the political mobilization for the war with the developments in the war and with the life of the soldiers and the people and make it a, a continuous movement, right? This, this is about, I, I think that my research is really touching on how, how it is that we, how is it that we do that? Right. If we're talking about organizing and we're talking about organization, right? What are we organizing for? What are we building organization for? I mean, if we're not building it for power, then then why are we building it? Right. And again, it goes back to the question. I mean, are we trying to get greater access to settler colonial society, or are we working towards national self determination and liberation? I mean, they're, they're, the questions are there, right? I mean, they're they're right in front of us. To me, they're obvious, right? But I mean, if you look at the reaction that they bring on, you know, I think it also proves that other people think the same thing. They just don't want to say it. So, you know, what does the Chicano movement mean, right? The political, cultural education is the crucial task. This is the thing that we must do. We must be involved in political, cultural education. So as a result of that, we propose as the mainstay of this organizing initiative to educate, mobilize, organize, and arm the whole of the people to take part in the resistance. The development of Chicano political will is crucial to cultural political victories. So the Chicano political will. Now there's a phrase that you don't hear very often, right? And and, and that's the those are the questions, right? That's the thing is that it's, we can always name something, right? Naming something is some is sometimes it's that's the easy part. The question is what comes after the naming, right? So we've said we need to develop Chicano political will, right? But what does that mean? I mean, that's that's really the question. An organized political movement produces actionable power as a consequence of the mobilization of the people. Actionable power power that can be acted upon. So part of what, uh, in, in order to sort of like begin to frame this out, what I started thinking about was um, this idea of low intensity organizing, right? And so, because, you know, there's there's lots of different ways that people approach organizing. You know, there's electoral organizing, there's uh, union organizing, there's community organizing, there's student organizing. You know, and you know, there's all these different institutes that have created like this is the Midwest Institute for organizing, and this is our model, and, and this is this is how you organize, right? And and I think all that's great. What I also think is there are a lot of people out there who understand the basic uh, skill set of being an organizer, right? Um, there are certain things that you that you have to do in order to mobilize around an issue. I don't think that it's really that important as for us, like thinking about like how we do this within the Chicago movement. I don't think that what we need to do is teach people the skills of organizing, right? What we need to teach them is the strategy of change. How is it that we get from point A to, to point B. And it's not just from passing out flyers or, or having meetings or any of those things, right? I mean, it's really about and goes to fundamentally to this idea of education. So when we're looking at low intensity organizing, like part of when I was writing the, my uh, book, Insurgent Aslan, I ran across this article that's listed down here at the bottom. It's called Low Intensity Conflict Environment of the 1990s, right? So I spent a lot of time reading um, in these military uh, journals about insurgency and, and different things like that. And they're, they're, they're fascinating, right? Um, and they're fascinating from, from the perspective that uh, counterinsurgency particularly is about cultural disruption, okay? It's about uh, vying for, or like a, what was his name? I can't remember the general's name, the hearts and the minds, right? And so, thinking about, you know, how it is that you do that, but this low intensity conflict's a little bit different, right? 
because it, it's talking about uh, conflict is viewed as a long-term endeavor and therefore strategy and tactics must be flexible and adaptive. I mean, what this is really talking about is creating a situation in an area, you know, this low intensity conflict that basically the living conditions become unmanageable, right? It's not like a whole bunch of people are being slaughtered or there are pitch battles or anything like that. It's that the, 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 there's always something happening that keeps people from being able to achieve what it is that they need to in order to you know, have a, a decent life, right? That's the idea of it, right? That's the idea of how it is through this low intensity conflict that populations get tired and then they, and then they give up over a period of time. So what I started thinking about was what, you know, what if organizing was low intensity, right? So instead of everything being about like, you know, um, uh, we're gonna get this person elected or, you know, we need to sign this uh, union contract or, you know, everything is like, everything in organizing is very goal oriented, right? Like we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. So part of the problem is, and I say this as a person who's who's been an organizer, a, a professional organizer for, for almost 30 years now, or close to 30 years anyway, um, is that what I have watched happen over and over again, right, is that the energy that is built up through these very like goal-oriented um, organizing campaigns, it just dissipates immediately afterwards. I mean, look at look at the presidential election. Millions of people are mobilized to elect one person to to the to the office. And as soon as that person is elected, where do all of those millions of people go who were so concerned about the political future of the country just a few weeks ago? I mean, they, they all go home, right? That energy dissipates and it dissipates on purpose because we don't live in a political system that is set up for that type of um, continuous engagement, right? That's where the that's where the irritation then comes in, but it comes in, in in a completely different way. So how is it that we, through the Chicano community, create situations of um, of low intensity organizing? And and what is what does that entail, right? So part of what low intensity um, organizing entails or some of the values, right? Is, uh, and we're thinking about this as, as, a, as a whole piece, to train organizers to work in the Chicano indigenous community, okay? So, and I think earlier, like I was saying, we're not just training them in terms of teaching them how to you know, hand out flyers or run a meeting. What we're doing is training them to think about uh, organizing strategically, which I think is, is a very different thing politically educate the Chicano indigenous community, right? Build a vehicle for the political expression of the Chicano indigenous community. Organize Chicano indigenous communities to answer back some of the more serious attacks, immigration, school reform, imprisonment of our youth. And this is this final one I think is, is the most important, but I also think it's the one that we haven't really done, right? Like we haven't made a serious, a super serious attempt at this. And, and the people who have, I think you know that organization exists for a while, and then it's absolutely co-opted, you know, by money and, and by all these other things, right? So, and I mean, you know, part of the question that we have to ask ourselves is, you know, how do we keep that from happening? So we organize a broad front political machine that will work to teach advocacy and self-reliance through education and creation of policy that strengthens the Chicano Indigenous community, right? See, in my mind, this is this is what makes up a lot of this idea of, of low intensity organizing because none of these things are something that will ever end. They're all, they're all goals. It's like a goalless practice, kind of. That's the way that I think that when we think about organizing in, in the Chicano community, we should think of it as a goalless practice, right? Because these are things that have to happen over and over and over again, right? I mean, people are like, oh, you know, we need a better world. We need to defeat capitalism. Well, I'm telling you right now, you ain't going to defeat capitalism next week. And you ain't going to defeat it the week after or the week after or the month after or the year after, right? I mean, this is, this is an ongoing process where people 
in our community have to be confronted with alternative information, not alternative facts, but alternative information, information that they, they're not going to get from the approved channels of settler colonial education, right? And so we think we, we have to think this through. And so what does it mean to, to create all these things? So when we think about failure, all right? And then, so my question would be, you know, what does success look like? Well, I believe that success is about embracing indigeneity. Um, I think that by doing that it exposes the lie that Chicanos and Latinos are mainly immigrants. Um, and that this, I believe that this distortion, right, of our, of, of who we are, where we're from, uh, contributes to our, our lack of political power. And then Chicanos and Latinos uh, regain and see the Chicano struggle within a national and international context. I, I think that for, for mostly good intentions, um, that in our communities that we uh, find a way to constantly scale down the movement um, instead of scaling up the movement. I think that it is uh, this, this whole like fascination or fetishization, I think is probably a better way of the community. Like, like everybody is always like, oh, I'm the, you know, the, the, the expert of my own experience, right? Okay, no shit, I'm the expert of my own experience, right? I mean, how does that challenge capitalism? How does that challenge the state? It doesn't, right? I mean, absolutely 100% it's given that we're all the expert of our own experience, right? But that's not a return to history. That's not a return to nation, right? That's not a, a return to self-determination. It's not even a return to individual self-determination because actually nothing has changed about our material condition, right? So we have to sort of take this piece about the community and, and put it in its proper place, right? Because it's, it's not the top of the pyramid. And I mean, it's important, right? I mean, our, community, our communities need to be strong, but it's, it's not the top of the pyramid. And so when we regain that national and international context, right, then, then what we begin to see is that we, we are a, a, a distinct and individual people, right? And that we have a, a, a political position within this settler society, right? We are not without politics. And, and I think that's, that's the important part, right? And when I say politics, I don't mean Democrat and Republican. I mean our politics, I mean Chicano politics, right? The kind of politics that produce actionable power that allows us to build towards nation that allows us to build towards these ideas of, of self-determination. So some of the organizations this past year that um, I, I helped start this, uh, this nonprofit, it's called Mexicanos 2070. The organization was founded on a paper written by Armando B. Rendon. The title of the paper was The Blueprint for the Next 50 Years. Uh, the goal of this organization is to create a think collective, right? Um, and through this think collective, uh, we would begin to work with uh, other organizations, you know, this is, to, to build this, this broad front, right? How do we bring these different organizations together and, and not to subsume them, right? That's not the goal, right? The goal is to bring them together. And as I talked a little bit in the, um, in the uh, abstract for the talk about that Japanese uh, corporation uh, style uh, kiratsu, right? And, and basically what that is, is it's a horizontal uh, style these different corporations who all have some sort of interest in, in the production of, of whatever the, the thing is that, that everybody is making, they come together and, but not vertically, it horizontally. And they create this, uh, this network, right, of organizations that, that work or corporations that work to support, you know, these, these particular products or the idea or the production of these products, right? And, and, and that's really one of the models that we're trying to to incorporate, you know, with this and, and to think about it, you know, like when we say broad front, what, what is it that we mean? So part of what we've been doing for Meshkanos 2070 is we have uh, monthly webinars. We actually have a webinar tomorrow. Um, we have uh, three experts on the Treaty of the Guadalupe Hidalgo who will be speaking uh, one o'clock tomorrow. That's one o'clock Arizona time. Uh, we launched a uh, project 
in September called the Colegio Chicano del Pueblo, which I'll talk about in a second. And on March 31st, uh, we are <clears throat> presenting the first Aztlan report, which will be a report back to the community, a national report back. And we'll have uh, organizations from all over the country uh, coming in to report on the different things that, that they're doing. Uh, the Colegio Chicano del Pueblo is, uh, was launched on September 16th, uh, 2020. Uh, currently, there are not 638 students. I think there are now 600 and about 45 students. Uh, we've had several students sign up in the last couple of days. It is a, it is a free online Chicano studies uh, college. Um, we started on September 16th with two courses. On January 10th, uh, we expanded to six courses. Um, we will have 15 courses by May 1st and 30 courses by December uh, 2021. Um, I'm very confident that we are on track to um, hit these numbers. We also uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with Prescott College, uh, who keeping in its uh, longstanding tradition of advocating for social justice um, has agreed to um, create and has created a uh, pathway to college credit for students who are completing uh, these courses uh, through the Colegio. Um, I think that would also be uh, remiss of me if I didn't tell you that um, we signed up 600 students off of one press release. Um, that's all we've ever sent out is one press release. And, uh, you know, people went crazy, right? So when we think about these ideas of, of low intensity organizing, right, what, what we have to do is we have to train organizers. We have to politically educate the community. You know, um, we have to begin to build uh, organizations, right, that are going to um, to politically uh, mobilize or galvanize the community, and, and not not for Republicans or Democrats, right, but but for but for us, right, for Rasa. That that's the um, that that's the thing. How do we do this, right? But we want to take that energy. I mean, think about it. Think about it. If Chicanos, Mexicanos, Latinos, whatever, if they worked as hard for themselves as they do for white politicians, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation right now, right? So with, uh, you know, the uh, El Partido Nacional de la Raza Unida, right? The Raza Unida Party, which, you know, uh, was created in the, 19, in the late 1960s and the early 70s, um, had some real success, uh, has, you know, kind of shrunk. Uh, there was a chapter in uh, Pacoima. Uh, my very good friend, Ernesto Ayala, uh, and his father and his family were some of the main people that were keeping it alive uh, and who did keep it alive. And so, you know, one of the things that we've done is that we've reestablished the National uh, Central Committee. We hold membership study groups um, and we're working on chapter development. Now see, this is one of the things like the pandemic has been bad, but this is actually one instance where the pandemic really worked in our favor, right? Because now, instead of having to go around to all these different cities, which is what people would have expected before, now we just throw out the Zoom link and people from all these different cities come into the meeting, you know? And so, I mean, this is also, it also is uh, redoing the way that we think about organizing. Um, so the big, uh, what's that thing called? Sabbatical project for um, this fall is, or this year is this. I mean, this is one of them anyways. The Rathu Nita platform and message development. I mean, we're uh, rewriting the entire political platform for, for Rathu Nita. And I think in some ways for, you know, the, uh, for a large part of the Chicano movement, right? And so what we're doing is, um, we're going to design and implement a focus group study using newly written plat platform positions from La Raza Unida Party to develop grassroots political messaging for the uh, Chicano community. I mean, I expect to, that we'll have these, uh, we'll hold the focus groups over the summer and have this paper written and published, uh, you know, sometime this fall. And so, I mean, part of what, if we look over here in the corner too, you know, we talk about Chicano studies research, we talk about Chicano studies. I, I think that this also, has a lot to do with just Chicano organizing in general. Um, I, I've taken these questions from an article that was written by Ronaldo Macias, uh, who is a professor at UCLA, and who I've had the pleasure of the last couple of months really spending some time talking to. 
but uh, Prophet Macias is his article is about Chicano studies, and he said that Chicano studies deals with three main questions, right? Who are we? What is our material condition? And what can we do about it? So in, even in terms of everything that we're talking about, right, if we take those three questions and lay that over the top of the rest of the framework that, that's being developed, what we're starting to do, I believe, is develop a very nuanced political stance, right, that is separate from the politics of settler colonial society. Right. It doesn't mean that that we're not affected by those politics. It doesn't mean that necessarily that we can even escape them. But we can have a conversation that is about us and not about them. That part, I absolutely believe. When we think about this, right, part of what we're doing is really heightening the contradictions. Right. And this gets back into, you know, the organizing. I think that this becomes a, a, a very important focus of the research and the academic work, okay? Because, you know, in the society that we live in, everybody is constantly trying to flatten contradictions. Oh, we need to all get along. You know, if those people would just stop thinking that way, right? But, you know, heightening contradictions, right? That, that dialectic, the, the whole idea of, of questioning to arrive at the truth, right? Or the, the idea, I think, even of, of Ponche Bay, right? To, to arrive at the root of the truth, right? How do you arrive at the root of the truth if you are not questioning, right? So heightening contradictions is a strategy to prepare people for confrontational tactics. Now, unfortunately, when people hear the word confrontation, they think that it means a fight, okay? And, and it does, but it doesn't necessarily mean a fist fight, but it's a confrontation because sometimes things must be confronted. So if we prepare our people, if we repair, prepare our community, right, and we do that through education and through training and through building these organizations, right, then, you know, it might not necessarily have to be as bad as people necessarily think, right? Exposing contradictions between opposing groups is based on the fundamental belief in the irreconcilable differences in values, beliefs, and most of all, interests. I believe that there are irreconcilable differences between settler colonialism and the Chicano movement. I also believe that there is, there is a permanent confrontation between Mesoamerican society and Western civilization or Western society in the Americas. Those things are irreconcilable. They cannot be brought together, right? One will exist or the other one will exist. And the question is the question is still to be determined. So uh, those are the, the big projects that I have going on. These are some on, other ongoing projects. Um, I'm developing with a group of people uh, a website or a project called War of the Flea Media. Um, and we're uh, developing this website, uh, which is waroftheflea.org. I mean, we're looking at um, doing all of these uh, things through that, uh, particularly a series of documentaries um, we have the Reality Dysfunction Podcast, which uh, publishes weekly. Uh, we will publish our 100th episode in June of 2021. This podcast is de dedicated to Chicano Latino politics. It's what we talk about, or it's what we try to talk about. But I I'll tell you, you know, the longer that you uh, talk about Chicano Latino politics in the world that we live in, the more you realize that, um, you know, our politics are, are very limited, right? It's hard to talk about this without talking about uh, white politicians. Uh, War of the Flea, Fight for Chicano Studies, the documentary uh, that I've been working on. And I'm also uh, starting my second book project. Uh, starting is not really true. I've already started it. My second book project called Chicano Revolt, the in-depth examination of the Metro student movement in Lansing, Michigan in the 1990s. Uh, so, you know, and just roll, roll through these real quick. Um, I don't know where my, uh, I had a, a video hooked onto this for you guys. Oh, there it is. Oh, uh, wait a minute. The video is not going to, the video is not going to work. Sorry. It's not going to work because I didn't turn the sound on. Um, but uh, next time. And then, uh, so th this is a, sort of the lead in for the reality dysfunction. This is a, a little page about the uh, War of the Flea. Um, 
there is a there's a video that that also goes with this too. There's a trailer. Actually, hold on a second. I would really like for you guys to see this trailer. Um, I'm gonna try this again. This time I'm gonna make sure that the sound is up. How do you not teach Chicago studies and call yourself an educational institution? Okay, I should have played with that one a little bit more. The um, but this is uh, this is Dr. Teresa Melendez. She's the founder of uh, Chicano Latino Studies at Michigan State University. This is a quote uh, from her um, her uh, interview. Um, and then Chicano Revolt again, uh, my second um, book project. Uh, this is a sort of a little abstract for it. This is a news clip uh, that I have from that time talking about um, Cesar Chavez Avenue. Uh, there was a push uh, in the early 90s in Lansing, Michigan to rename one of the uh, streets downtown uh, Grand Avenue. Um, after that happened, um, there was a pushback by the white community um, and they forced a vote uh, on, on Cesar Chavez Avenue and the, um, uh, they, res they resoundingly voted that down and changed it back to Grand Avenue. Um, for the next uh, 20 some years, uh, many of us in the community uh, worked very hard to uh, change that. And it wasn't until just like within the last two or three years that the city council um, overturned that. So in closing, you know, there's some milestones, uh, you know, as, in terms of testimonials, I think that it's non-exaggeration to say that hundreds of Chicano, Chicanos, Chicanoxes from around the country are involved in these projects. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, you know, you can email me. <clears throat> this is sort of a timeline for what I have going on. Um, you know, in 2020, we launched my Chicanos. Uh, September 2020, launched the Colegio. Uh, by June or July of this year, I should have a rough draft of the documentary. By October, we hopefully will have finished this focus group uh, study. And then by May of 2022, um, I'm hoping to have a rough draft of uh, Chicano Revolt done. And then final thoughts on low intensity organizing. Uh, you know, as it says, exposing contradictions between groups is based on the fundamental belief. Oh, so we read that one already. The greater the amount of pressure, uh, the more incentive there is to resolve it. And um, yeah, again, organizing a broad front. Uh, and so I'm gonna leave you with Mao and Arafat. In the absence of certain definite conditions, quick victory is something that exists only in one's mind and is not in objective reality. And that uh, Gauser Arafat said, people are the greatest resource. And that is all I have in terms of my presentation. All right. Thank you, Todd, for that really wonderful presentation. Uh, incredibly informative, incredibly powerful. My brain's a little mind boggling. Um, I think, you know, uh, I wish we could give you that standing ovation that you definitely deserve right now. We do have a few questions for you. Okay. Uh, and uh, the first is, can you talk more about how the set settler colonial projects impact can be seen and felt and heard in educational institutions, specifically as it relates to the Chicano and indigenous communities? Well, I mean, I, I think the, you know, it's basically understanding and recognizing that the, the history that we live in is, is not our own, right? And I mean, it's, it's uh, very clear uh, because, I mean, you know, when, when students protest for Chicano studies, I mean, they're, you know, they want history classes, they want, they want this, they want that. Um, and so it's just, uh, I mean, the impact is there. I think, I think it's, it's not just there, it's fundamental. And I think that, you know, when we uh, think about it in terms of like hegemony, or I, I think actually a better way to think about it is common sense, right? I mean, it's common sense in our educational system that people need to know who George Washington is, that they need to know who Thomas Jefferson is, right? That's, that's just common sense. Like, why would you even question that? You know, that it's important to know who the presidents of the United States are, right? That's because that's the, that's the history that's being recorded right now. And so I think that, you know, once you start to look at it like that, then I think that, um, you know, it's impact or it's influence. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's just right there. It's everywhere, it's all over us. There's no escaping it. So 
what are the lessons we can take from this and apply it to something like Palestinian liberation? Oh, I think that um, the lessons are coming uh, the other way. I think they're coming from the Palestinians to us. I don't think that that they're necessarily coming from us to them. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it's very clear that the, the Palestinian uh, struggle has been won for nation and for land and, uh, you know, for self-determination and autonomy, um, for the right of return to lands that they were dispossessed from. I mean, I think that these are all, um, these are all important factors, right, that, that Chicanos um, and, and I think other Latinos in the Americas, right, really need to, um, to, uh, to look at and to, and to think about how does that, how does that impact what we're, what we're doing here, you know, and, and I, I just want to be really clear, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we should, uh, you know, get a history book and follow exactly what, what they did, right, because that's, that's a different place, it's a different group of people, it's, there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that are different. And I think that that's part of the, that's part of the conundrum. It's part of the struggle is that we, we have to figure out a way to, um, we have to figure out a, a way for ourselves, right? Like Fanon says that every, every generation out of relative secure, uh, obscurity, right? Has to find their purpose, you know, and that they either, they either succeed or they fail at that. And, and I think that that's, uh, I, mean, I think it's really true. Wonderful. Um, last question, and just a reminder the, to folks that you can put your questions in the chat. We still have a few minutes. Um, how does the Chicano movement relate to the Black Lives Matter movement or other indigenous and native peoples movements? Um, are they separate? Are they working on the same issues? Is there communication? Like, can you kind of give us a analysis of what the lay of the land looks like? I mean, I can give you what it looks like to me. I think that that's, that, that's important to, to start that conversation. Um, I mean, I think that to the extent that um, we're talking about fundamental human issues, like the, 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 the right to exist, once you exist, the right to continue existing, um, I think that, that they're very much the same. I mean, clearly the, um, I think that the, the American imaginary, the, the US imaginary um, is, uh, it, it's much more obsessed with black people than it is with um, with Chicanos or or other Latinos, and and I do, and I do mean obsessed. Um, I think that you know, and and these kinds of questions are tough because sometimes it gets into it. Sometimes it can really get into those like who's oppressed more, right? And that's not that that's not the the purpose of this at all. I think that um, yeah, I, I mean. So in some ways they're the same, but in, in some ways they're, they're not, right? I mean, when you're talking about uh, Chicanos, when you're talking about indigenous people, I mean, you cannot dismiss the issue of land, right? You cannot dismiss uh, the issue of, of sovereignty. And that's just not an issue that has really existed uh, in, in the black experience in, in this country. Um, and so, I mean, there's some, you know, there's some differences, right? I think that, uh, yeah, well, I think that's I think that's that's kind of the, the biggest one. I also think it's the reason why um, why uh, Chicanos, especially at the um, well, I'm I'm very interested to hear how that's not true. But uh, let me finish this statement. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah. I guess I, I can't remember what I was going to say, but I am really interested in hearing how that's not true. If that person is still on. Um, I don't know if they can speak and we're actually coming up on the hour mark. Okay. Um, to move this into a faculty happy hour. So if there's any just like last minute shorter questions, you can put them in the chat. And if not, uh, we're going to ask um, in just a couple of minutes for non faculty to head out. So our faculty can do some community building together. But if there's any last minute questions, um, and as to the student who I know asked that question, we will definitely follow up and I will connect you with Todd via email. Um, I know both of you, so it won't be a problem. Sure, I would love I would love to have that conversation. Wonderful. Very interested in what you have to say. Yeah, so we'll definitely do that over email just in the interest of time. But um, any last questions? All right. I think we're good. 
Todd, thank you so much for joining us for yeah. the first in the faculty speaker series. This has been wonderful, super informative, super educational, very powerful. Um, I'm a little mind boggled. It's going to take me some time to deal with this, um, which seems to happen every time I hear a lecture from you um, and learn from it and break it down. Um, for those of you who are not faculty, thank you so much for joining us for the first hour. Um, he definitely did set a high bar for these moving forward. Um, the next one is in uh, next month, we'll be doing these um, every month. And I believe the next speaker is, let me pull that out of my notes, which of course I lost um, right, you know, when I needed them. Um, we'll have the next speaker in just a couple of uh, weeks in March, I think March 17. Um, I don't know if that person is here, but if they want to uh, add any notes into it, um, that would be wonderful. And we have information up on the Facebook page. Uh, very, very excited that we were able to have this connection. Oh, here it is, March 17, Mary Jackson, Associate Faculty and Program Coordinator of the Outdoor Education Leadership um, MA will be presenting on adventure and embodiment of place. So please mark your calendars for that. Um, and as uh, for now, I think we're, we're good. And for non-faculty, feel free to, yes, uh, we will have many conversations about land and all of those things, but uh, for non-faculty, we invite you uh, to you know, join us next time and we'll see you next time. And for now, um, this next section is just faculty only.